Are you ready to go from burned out to blissed out? I'm Rebecca Whitman. I will share with you my seven pillars of abundance and interview experts that will help you get all seven areas of your life in alignment so that you can be balanced, beautiful, and abundant. Let's get into the show. Welcome everyone to the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant podcast. I am your host, Rebecca Whitman, helping you go from burned out to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. We are so appreciative of the support this show has had over the last four years, all the downloads and the subscriptions and the reviews and keep sharing this podcast because this is how we support the show and we keep going and spreading our mission of empowering people to go from burned out and overwhelmed to balanced, beautiful and abundant. And today we have an amazing guest. Welcome to the show, Melissa Robinson. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. It is so great. And I met you online in a networking group, and I just loved your mission of wanting to empower people worldwide to lead with empathy and EQ. And I knew that you would be the perfect guest for the show. So I am going to share with my listeners a little bit about your background. So Melissa took the plunge as an empathy and EQ coach after losing a career to a, an unempathetic leader. Her goal is to teach people how to create better leadership with this key element that so many leaders are missing, and that is EQ through the use of empathy. She brings 30 years experience to the table. She is pursuing a second doctorate in interdisciplinary leadership with a focus on empathy in leadership. She has also received her MBA and multiple certifications, such as one in change management. She has had decades as a coach, and she is the perfect person to counsel current and emerging leaders. So thank you for all the great work that you're doing, bringing empathy to leadership. Uh, my first question is, how did you become so passionate about empathy and realize that this was kind of the missing ingredient in current leadership? Well, this one actually goes way back because I was a musician. I was a classical musician. I was a French hornist for a long time, but I was one of those nerdy kids that knew music was what I wanted to do from the time I was like really, really young. So I started playing. I started doing stuff. My dad was military. So we moved every two years. So it's like, I never had a foundation except for music. Cause that was the thing I could always take with me. That was the thing that was solid in my life. And so I continued on with this. Cause I was just certain that I wanted to play in orchestras and I wanted to go places and do things. And there wasn't a lot of money in my family. So I just kind of dug in and went for it. And I, knew that I needed a certain amount of stability as well. Cause you know, I mean, you're an artist too. Sometimes being an artist is not a stable lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, you're trying to make enough money to, to pay for breakfast tomorrow. So I was like, I'm going to get my doctorate. I'm going to settle in at a university. I'm going to be a professor and, and teach because I love doing that too. So what did you get? I know you have multiple degrees. What did you get your first doctorate in? That is a uh, doctorate in French horn performance and education. <laughs> wow, that is a very specific lane. Okay. <laughs> it is. It really is. And, and that was I a mean, PhD? it's what's called an EDD. So it's a okay. doctorate of education, but it's okay. the same cool. idea, just it's geared more towards practitioner instead of researcher because I okay. didn't really want to sit in a library. <laughs> Okay. okay, so your first degree was in French horn, and then mm -hmm. where did, yep. you were, did you become a professor? I did, which is so pretty cool university? because at Portland State University out, in, out west. And your class was called what? Well, I taught a whole bunch of classes. I taught theory. I conducted the brass ensemble. I had my studio. I did conferences. I worked with the regional horn society and the international horn society. I mean, who would think there was enough French hornists out there to have an international horn society, but there is. 
<laughs> that's that's yeah. incredible. So what, where did you go from there? What was the next step in your journey? Well, unfortunately, um, I had a pretty nasty run-in with one of my colleagues. Um, I would go as far as to say I was assaulted by this person. I'm and so I don't- sorry. Physically assaulted at, at the job? Yeah. I'm yep. so sorry, that's awful. It was. And the thing that really caught me was then trying to move up through the system and trying to get someone to listen to what had happened. This is before me too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people weren't necessarily as open to hearing it. But the thing that kept confusing me all the way through, I mean, the initial incident aside, is that no matter what I did, I just couldn't seem to get anyone to listen. Mm -hmm. No one wanted to hear what was going on. And it's like no one could feel what this was doing to me. So after being there for seven years and being in music for over 40, I ended up having to walk away from my entire career because it was just so destroyed by the end of all of it that there was just nothing left. So I ended up coming back to the Midwest because my dad had some health problems and it was right about the time COVID hit and everything happened. But it was like, there was a part of me that just wasn't willing to let it go. I didn't understand what had happened. I didn't understand how it got so out of hand. And I wanted to understand why. I just, I, I needed to know why this could have been taken away like this. Why people that I think were genuinely good people just couldn't hear me. Why the system had been allowed to be so broken. And the thing I kept coming back to is they seemed to miss this piece of being able to relate to me which is what empathy is. It's when you feel what another person is feeling. You're not taking responsibility. You're not you know, trying to fix it, but you're saying, I can feel what you're feeling and I get it. I may not have been in your situation, but I get what it is. And so I started digging in some more, came up on this idea of EQ and emotional intelligence and, and started seeing all of the articles and all the magazines about how it's the number one leadership skill to have. And yet so many leaders seem to lack it. And so I decided I could either stay under my bed and cry all day, or I could take that energy and try to put it to something good and maybe keep somebody from going through what I went through. And that's where the second doctorate and the extra education and really beginning to build on this came from. Because I just, I'm, I'm not willing to let anybody else suffer for, for a reason that's so fixable. That is so beautiful that you turn your your pain. I like to tell my clients, your message is in your mess and going from victim to victor. And that is exactly what you're doing with, with your story. So that is, that is beautiful. So people think of empathy and EQ and they don't think about productivity in the bottom line. I think that's why a lot of uh, business leaders are like dismissive of it. They're like, I just want to get my numbers in, make the board happy. So can empathy and EQ actually create productivity and profit in a company? You know, the thing is, is that any organization is made of people. You know, processes don't make products. Machines don't make products. AI doesn't make products. People make processes, which then make products. So the thing is, is if you are in touch with your people, if you are in touch with what they need, if you're actually able to create a synergistic collaboration instead of this command and control leadership style, you'd be amazed at how productivity and innovation just soar, which in turn goes to the bottom line. I'm working with a director now and he's in a healthcare system and he was like, okay, I don't know what to do walking into this because everybody says we need better culture here. Our culture is just a mess. We don't know what to do with it. And of course, everybody's like, you know, throwing their hands up. I don't know. It's culture. So we figured out a strategy where the first thing he would do is go in every single day and just do what he would call his rounds. He would go and he would see his people. Oh, one on one and come out of the office? No way. So, and it didn't, it wasn't like a major thing. It's not like he was getting in four hour long conversations. He would just cruise down the hall and see everybody and say, Hey, how you doing? What's happening? You going to the vacation home, you know, whatever. 
and he needed to get it from his computer anyway. So it was kind of a win-win situation. But just by making that human connection and seeing his people every day, they got to know him. Now they know who he is. Now they're starting to understand who this person is and how he works, which means then they were starting to trust him. Well, as they trusted him, they started coming to him with ideas. You know, there's this huge inefficiency in this lab and we know how to fix it. Let's talk about how to do that. You know, we're losing all this money over here because of this antiquated system that's in place. The things that the people that are in the, in the rooms on the floor actually understand. So now he's getting all these great innovative ideas that are completely fixing this department. Then to top it off, they had had this ongoing hamster wheel of employees leaving because they couldn't take the culture anymore. Well, all of a sudden, people were staying put, they were bringing in their friends, and they were willing to do whatever needed to be done to get the job done. So productivity went way up. His employee satisfaction scores went through the roof. And when those went through the roof, so did the patient satisfaction scores, which means now we're getting into profit. That's really interesting because when people are thinking that they don't matter, they're just in some cubicle, they're just a number, they don't put their whole heart and soul into their work. They just kind of phone it in and they do the minimum to not get fired, but they don't really, like you say, innovate and take things to the next level. And that is such a really great example of when they had a friendship and a relationship and they actually thought the leader cared about them that they were they had their heart in it instead of just phoning it in and i think people want to feel like they're a part of something people are craving community community is one of my pillars of abundance with which is social and I feel like people feel uh, isolated. They're at home. A lot of people are working remotely from their computers and they're very isolated. So yeah. community is such a big component in people's lives. And that's how we were designed. You know, we were, yes. you know, cavemen and cave women that used to gather around the fire every night and, you know, cook and eat and share stories. And I feel like we're missing that. And what you're bringing to the corporate space of empathy is a way for people to reconnect. So if somebody's listening to this and they're a leader, what are some different ways that you suggest they make people feel that they care and feel connected to their leader? Other than you know, it's just active listening, which is a great one. Oh yeah, huge. I mean, that's one of those EQ skills that you just... <laughs> I was reading the other day that we lose in this country $1.2 trillion per year on bad communication, which is like, yeah, which is like saying, so you could send a manned mission to Mars for 500 billion. Elon Musk is worth 250 billion and you can buy an expensive luxury island with an airstrip and a harbor for 110 million. So for that 1.2 trillion, you could send Elon Musk to a private island on Mars and still have 500 billion left over for an after party. And we're just throwing it away on bad communication, <laughs> which is insane. But really the best way I think to be able to talk to employees and pull them in is to just relate to them as human beings. And really the way I try to get leaders to do that first is to be able to relate to themselves. Oh, that's a good, if you're listening, some people are just, I know I used to be that way. I was such a workaholic and I was so hard on myself. And I was also like running from any uncomfortable, painful emotions by being busy. So if leaders don't have a relationship with themselves, how can they have a relationship with their team? So that is that is a great point, Melissa. Let's let's dig into that. How can leaders develop a relationship with themselves so that they can be there for their team? The very first thing that I try and help leaders do is actually get a hold of showing self-empathy and self-compassion. And I mean, the idea of empathy, I understand is you, you know, you you understand what another person's feeling. So the, the response I get is, well, I know what I'm feeling. I'm in myself. And my response is usually, do you? Because these people, exactly like you pointed out, they're usually very driven. They're very motivated. They're very ambitious. 
but they may not be in their spot because they're the best leader. They may have been put there because they get the best contracts, because they have the highest paying clients, because they're best technician, and they've kind of been failed in that they haven't necessarily learned how to be a great leader, which leads to imposter syndrome, and they get really out of touch with themselves, which is why you end up with people in these positions that don't take care of their bodies, don't work out and eat like they should, end up with habits you know, that on, and substances that maybe they don't need. Have a family life that isn't as rich and maybe falling apart. They're out of touch with themselves enough that they're not watching what's actually happening in their own life. They're so, out of touch with their seven pillars of life, which is what I teach. You know, maybe they have their finances dialed in and they're a great leader, but they're out of touch with their fitness, their emotions, their romance. So that is uh, someone who is out of alignment and- yeah. When people are out of alignment, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Like you could have all the money in the world, but if you don't have your health, what good is it? Right. Exactly. So why do you think empathy is missing from our society? Why is it such a angry, abrasive, divisive feeling right now? Where did we lose that? kindness and compassion and caring about our neighbor, even saying hi to our neighbor. I mean, I live in a neighborhood in West LA. Oftentimes people don't even like look at you. And I'm sure New York City is the same way when you pass by, even though you're neighbors. So how can we bring this back? And what is your commentary on that? I think a lot of it has to do with the way we live our lives on, on two in two ways. I'm like holding up four fingers, two ways. <laughs> The first is just that we are just kind of disconnected. They're calling loneliness the epidemic of our time because people are mistaking likes on social media and, you know, interactions that are completely digital for human connection. And it's not that that stuff isn't fine as well, but that one-on-one -on -one human connection, you, you can't make up for it with the number of thumbs up that you get on Facebook. You just can't. Um, there's a couple of authors that are talking about this right now. Gene Twenge is one, but just how, because of this, you know, people kind of end up in a bubble because when you're on social media a lot, you become super hyper-focused on yourself because that's what you're seeing, the stuff that's coming back to you, the echo chamber that's coming back to you. So they kind of lose track on the humanity and the idea of the we instead of the me. So I think the first thing that needs to happen is that we need to reconnect one-on-one -on -one as human beings. What the solution is to that, I, I don't know, because the first thing that would need to happen is just a lot less technology, and, and that's just not going to happen like that. It's just not. But the other thing is a lot of other countries actually teach, they call it social emotional learning, but empathy is part of this. Kindness is part of this. Consideration is part of this. And they teach it in their schools. It's actually part of the curriculum. So you wow. start with like six-year-olds and they teach it from the time they're six all the way until they're 16. Their culture thinks this is important enough that it needs to be part of their children's education. And we're not really doing that in this country. And I think we're missing the boat there because a lot of other countries do. And countries that are named happiest nation on earth year after year. Like, what country uh, Denmark. is named the happiest nation on earth year after year? Denmark is always in the top five. And they were one of the first ones to deal with social emotional learning, like since the 70s, since the Nixon administration. That's incredible. I always yeah. heard Thailand was really happy. I don't know, but I do know that they teach social emotional learning in a lot of Asian countries. So now I have to look that up. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to look it up. I uh, noticed because I still uh, work at a children's acting school, super part time, just because I love the performing arts and I love kids and the kids are so focused on their technology. And a lot of them, you know, were very young during the pandemic where they lost three years of learning how to socialize that they don't have social basic social skills. They don't know how to make eye contact, which is a huge part of showing empathy, making eye contact. They're completely ADD distracted where they don't have the focus to actually have a conversation. And I really think America needs to start teaching social and emotional skills because as the technology increases, they're- Do you wanna know my biggest and best beauty secret? 
It is liquid collagen. I started drinking liquid collagen three and a half years ago, and I am totally obsessed. I have never looked younger, fitter, leaner, stronger. My skin is glowing. My hair is thick and shiny. Eyebrows, eyelashes, nails, they're all growing, and I feel like I'm aging backwards. If you really want to know a huge hack to be balanced, beautiful, and abundant, you got to try this collagen. It is amazing. If you go to the show notes, you will get a $10 off coupon. If you buy two bottles, it's $25 off. And there's two versions. There's one for anti-aging and overall health. And there's another formula for fat loss. Both formulas are amazing. They taste great and it's so easy to take. You just take a spoonful in the morning and a spoonful at night and just add it to your regimen. This stuff is off the charts. So make sure you go to the link in the show notes and grab yourself a couple bottles and tell me how much you love aging backwards. Thanks for watching the show and we'll be back to our regular content now just they're they're not learning how to socialize and connect and what kind of leaders are they going to be if they're all like looking away from each other and have ADD it's the exact opposite of your mission of you know helping people stay connected through empathy and leadership so yeah. that brings me to my next question the correlation between empathy and EQ first of all let's I know most people know what it is but in case somebody doesn't what is EQ is the first question and then how does empathy inform EQ so the basic definition of EQ that's kind of in a nutshell is the ability to understand and control your own emotions and to understand others emotions and I mean there's a lot more that goes into that but that's kind of the basis of it and for a long time, they actually lumped empathy in with emotional intelligence. And that's where what I'm doing is different because I actually think empathy is a precursor to emotional intelligence. The way I explain it is emotional intelligence is like this big, big tool bag, right? And you've got everything in this tool bag. You got chisels and hammers and screwdrivers and saws and whatever else you need. It's all in there, but you don't know what you need. So by actually relating to somebody with empathy, connecting with them on a human to human level. Now I know what you need. Now I know what I need to give you as a leader so I can reach into that tool bag and pull out a wrench instead of a hammer. So empathy is a precursor to um, EQ. I think so. Not EQ everyone would is, agree with that. EQ stands for emotional intelligence, right? Yes. What an IQ stands for intelligence, intelligence quotient. Yeah. I, IQ yeah. is intelligence. We all know about having a high IQ. EQ is emotional intelligence and empathy. Some people don't have it though. Some people are just like, as the saying goes, missing a sensitivity chip. Like some, are, some of the yeah. leaders like have to like fake being empathetic because they don't, they're like robots. They they're so in their analytical, logical side of their brain that they really don't care. So are those people yeah. like a lost cause or can you teach them this? So there's two sides to that question. The first is that a certain amount of empathy is actually biological. And so they figure between 95 to 98% of people are born with it. We've got it. It's in there somewhere, which means if you're one of those people and you've just never been able to tap into it, it's not necessarily a matter of learning it. It's a matter of learning how to practice it so that you can get better at it. You know, I mean, it's just like any other skill. If you don't practice it, well, it gets rusty. For the other 2%, I mean, there are or 2 to 5%, and you're right, there are people that don't have it. And if you absolutely have no empathy at all, you actually fall on what's called the dark triad. So we're talking psychopaths, Whoa. sociopaths, narcissists, Ooh. Machiavellians. Yeah. And they are just super bad news. But having no empathy at all is a hallmark of these people. So if that's the case, in all probability, 
they're probably going to try to mimic empathy with what's called cognitive empathy. And what that means is you can logically get a hold of it. You know, you can you can think your way through it and go, well, I should react like this or I should react like that. And I have actually had someone that we've kind of tried to learn a little bit. You know, if someone acts like this, what should your response be? If someone is coming to you with that problem, what should your response be? And I mean, I can't diagnose someone as dark triad because there's a lot of testing that goes into that. So there's no way I'm going to say someone's a psychopath without, without a whole lot more to it than that. But on the other hand, he was able to learn cognitive empathy, but just like anything else, again, it was practicing. So in the moment, would he remember to use it or, or did he even care? I mean, dark, dark triad has all sorts of stuff associated with it that they probably wouldn't use it at all anyway, because they wouldn't care because they just don't care. Um, and realistically, they usually don't last in top leadership positions very long because they can be extremely impulsive, which they're the ones that embezzle oh. billions of dollars and, you know, take off to Columbia kind of thing. So they can rise to the top because of how cutthroat they are, but they usually don't last there for that reason. That and they damage too many people on the way up. So there's lots yeah. of people who have their number. Wow. I, I think I, I have narcissistic tendencies. I care a lot about how I look. I want to achieve. I'm like very focused on my results, my workout, my supplements, my this, my that. But what makes me not an art, a narcissist is I am so empathetic. Like I'm an empath. My heart just, it bleeds for the, the pain of the world and the people. And I mean, sometimes I just sit there and just cry for the collective because there's just so much pain in the world right now. And I think yeah. people who are empaths, we feel it. It's like, there's so much going on right now. And I'm not talking about just the, all the awful stuff that's been going on since the beginning of time, like wars and rumors of wars and the starving children, but there's just seems to be like, there's more pain. So what advice do you have for people like me that are empaths that feel too much empathy and they just, their heart is constantly breaking what do you tell them to do to kind of like protect themselves so that they can that they can keep their emotional well-being? Well, and you hit on a good point because you have to keep your emotional well-being because yeah. if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. So even if you do feel for all of these different people and horrible situations, if you're mulch, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. So a lot of healthcare professionals actually suffer from what's called empathy fatigue, mm. which is where you just feel it so strongly all the time that after a while, you just can't, you're wrung out. And so you have to kind of learn to set up boundaries to a certain degree, at least so that you can protect yourself. And that doesn't mean getting calloused. That doesn't mean not paying attention to what's going on, but instead really concentrating on the things you can control and the things that you can't, because I know what you mean about feeling for some of these world situations, but you can also go, okay, yes, I want to do for this. Yes, I can, you know, give a certain amount of money. Yeah, I can give a certain amount of time, but I can't control this situation at all. So I need to be able to set up that boundary and disconnect enough to take care of myself so that I can contribute, so that I can feel, so that when I am making these connections to a single person or even to a group, there's enough of me left to give and I'm not just completely empty. I love what Abraham Hicks says. They said, you can't get sick enough to make a sick, a sick person get well. You can't get poor enough to get a poor person wealthy. You can't get hungry enough to get a hungry person fed. So us depleting ourselves and, and losing our emotional well-being isn't going to help us be of service to those in need. But if we keep filling ourselves up through spirituality, self-love, self-care, we actually can go out and fundraise or start a nonprofit or, you know, go to a soup kitchen or, or be of service in any way that we can. So I, I really like uh, what you said. Um, I know you have a new book coming out that you're diligently writing this summer. Tell us about the book, uh, the title, 
the premise, what inspired you to write it? So the title is The Empathic Leader, How EQ Via Empathy Transforms Leadership for Better Profit, Productivity, and Innovation. Because what I've actually found is exactly like we were talking about is you can get hard bottom line metrics that show that this works. You know, one of my masters is in data analytics because I really am that kind of a nerd. I actually <laughs> like statistics and it's okay because there has to be someone that digs it, right? But there really is hard bottom line proof that empathy and EQ contributes to better profit, to better innovation, to better productivity. And I wanted to put this in a book because the way I approach it is different. No one else is talking about it the way I am. So I wanted to be able to put down kind of what my method is. I wanted to be able to talk about some stuff that's really you know hot right now, like AI, like the generational friction, like this great resignation that's supposed to be coming up in the fall. We're supposed to see another one because people are so fed up with work and that sort of thing. And so this is, I, I was like, I'm going to write it. There's another it. big quit that's supposed to happen as, as what's it called? The big quit or the silent something, the, I don't know, um, but it's, supposed wait, to be even worse. I'm obsessed with generational psychology. I, I love generational psychology where I didn't know there was, I thought they were just some funny TikTok videos. Is there really generational friction? Oh yeah. What big between time. which generations? So the way this was all put together originally is yeah. someone, researcher, looked at the different generations, but it was all according to the relationship with technology. Oh, okay. So you think of the boomers who, you know, I mean, the joke is that they, they can't turn on a computer, right? That sort of thing. Gen X, which is what I am, who grew up when Atari was coming and all of a sudden computers were in the workplace. Millennials who have never known life without the internet, Gen Z, who's never known life without a computer in the pocket in the way of the iPhone, and now the alphas that are coming after that. So a lot of the friction that happens is technologically based. These different generations don't understand each other because they have such vastly different relationships with technology, which I think is fascinating, you know, to be able to take it back to that. And I mean, there's other things too, but even when you think about different experiences, well, that's because boomers had to go figure out something else to do because some of them remember a time before TV, as opposed to, you know, the alphas that are scrolling all the time. And, and they're kind of the jokes. I mean, they're the TikToks and the memes, but they're kind of true, too. <laughs> but is there friction where people can't get along in the society and in the workforce because of generational psychology? Like, they yeah. don't know how to, like... A Gen Zer wouldn't know how to relate to a Gen Xer because they like just assume, okay, do this technology, bring back the assignment in five minutes, and then the Gen Xer is like, hey, wait, I don't know how to do that. I need to go like watch a YouTube video first and learn it. And is that what you're talking about the the friction, or is it more like philosophical? Well, that's kind of where it began, but now it's become philosophical from that because okay. well, did you? Did you see the quote from Jodie Foster talking about how Gen Z is so lazy and she couldn't believe they couldn't get out of bed before 10? And did you, no. did you see that? No, what, yeah. is the, what is the quote? You can paraphrase it. Well, that was basically it. She was like, I don't want to work with Gen Z because they're lazy and they don't get out of bed before 10 and they don't know how to put in any work. And I'm like, this is Jodie Foster. <laughs> don't say that. But the point is, is that her, she, Jodie Foster, you know, I would assume she's probably Gen X, you know? Yeah. She sees them as lazy, whereas mm -hmm. for the Gen Z, their whole life, they've been able to go to technology and figure out what to do or how to do it. So they have a completely different way of looking at things than someone who's maybe had to dig in and do the hard work and thump and grind. Yeah. You know? So the technology has created these different realities, which then creates the friction. Okay, so let's go back to your book. Uh, mm -hmm. So you discuss uh, generational friction. What else? Um, I talk about AI. I talk about data and metrics and how even though they're supposed to be emotionless and unbiased, they're absolutely not because there's humans involved and mm -hmm. we will never be emotionless and unbiased. And at the end of each chapter, I actually include a video because we all learn differently, right? Right. 
Some people learn by listening, some people learn by watching, and I want to be able to reach as many people as possible. So I'm trying to make it as inclusive as I possibly can. Lovely. And when when is the book coming out and how can people find it? It will be out the end of September. It will be on Amazon for sure. But in the meantime, I do have a pre-sale. It's a stand store site called The Empathic Leader. And if you order there, it, it is a little bit cheaper and I will sign it. So Yay. I'm more than happy to autograph as many copies as people would like to buy. <laughs> awesome. And then you have a guide. Tell us about the guide for people who are listening to this and want to be more empathetic in their life. Absolutely. So if you head to my website, which is EQ via empathy. So, you know, EQ, emotional intelligence and the empathy and the via is just because it's shorter than saying EQ through the lens of empathy. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's a little, it's a little neater that way, but I do have a guide there for the top five things that leaders need to know now. And that's going to be a video and a PDF. And it also will put you on my newsletter so that I can keep you of praise of when the book comes out and all the other good stuff that we have going on right now. Thank you so much. Give us one action item to do after listening to this show to be more empathetic. That'll have a big effect in our life. Take the time to self-reflect. The thing is, is research says we have seven to nine opportunities to interact with people empathically in a day, every single day. But how many of us go right past it just because we're not paying attention? Whereas if you take a moment to look inside and go, well, was that person trying to talk to me? Did I miss this? Which part of this didn't work out right? And you can journal, you can talk to someone, you can meditate, you can do whatever you want, but take that time to go in and do the hard work on yourself so that you can then go out and do the work with everybody else. Right, first light yourself up and then you can be the light in the world and just spread love. So yes. how can people stay in touch with you, Dr. Melissa? Like, where are you hanging out online? Do you, you gave your website, where are you hanging out on social? I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram. And I have a YouTube channel, which is also the Empathic Leader, which is kind of like my playground. That's where I get to really interact with people and try out new ideas and get feedback and hear you know, what other people's experiences are. So any of those three places, you can find me, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Thank you so much, Dr. Melissa. You have been listening to another wonderful episode of the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant show, where we take you from burned out to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. I'm your host, Rebecca Whitman. And until we meet again, keep your vibe high and magnetized. Thanks, everyone. Wow, what an amazing show. I got so much value out of that, and I hope you did too. I would love to help you get unstuck. Which of the seven key areas of life do you feel blocked in? Maybe you are stuck in your love life and can't manifest your soulmate. Maybe you just can't lose that last 10 pounds. Maybe you are burned out and want to get out of your job and create a six-figure side hustle. I have great news for you. I am offering three complimentary breakthrough calls this week for the women and the men that are ready to get unstuck. This is a free 45-minute coaching call that I am offering to my listeners. Just go to the link in the show notes. And for those of you ready to really have the time of your life and end 2024 on an incredible note, you will want to learn more about the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant Retreat, October 3rd through 6th in Belize City, Central America. Not only will you learn how to get all seven areas of your life to a level 10 to end the year with momentum, but you will enjoy pampering in a luxury spa with healthy food, yoga, and sound bath. We will be having an incredible time on the beach, in the pool, walking around the beautiful city. It's in a private island, and it's just something that will be the best decision you ever made. I can't wait to spend a weekend with you in Belize City, Central America, on a private island. So if you're looking for more information on the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant Retreat, make sure you go to my link in the show notes. And for everybody else, 
thank you so much for supporting the show. We love our listeners, your reviews, your subscription, sharing this podcast with your friends and family is really getting the word out there that you do not have to go through life burned out. You can be balanced, beautiful, and abundant. Make sure you tune in next week and we'll see you soon. Bye.